28. It will finally, it'll eventually get on the screen behind me, but I'm just saying again, so everyone hears it. First Kings 22, 34 to 38. Uh, many of you would remember, I think it was uh, not 2020, but 2019, could be wrong, uh, when um, Pastor Brian Richmond came here and he did a revival. I don't know if you remember that. And it was a truly powerful uh, time. Uh, it really was a time, I really believe, with God. And I remember when he came and he preached, he mentioned, again, I'm, 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 I'm speaking out of memory, I hope you were here, you would remember it. He mentioned one time about he's going through this time where it's just, you know, just dry and nothing's really happening and uh, just, you know, things are not good. And he goes to morning prayer one morning, like he always does. He goes to morning prayer and he begins to pray. And while he's there, uh, he has an encounter with God that literally changes everything. And God really just begins to speak to him, just, just, just in a very real, in a very powerful way, begins to give him clear direction, begins to challenge him about specific things and areas in his life. And I want you to think about this. If you were here, you would know what I'm talking about. Here is this man. He's tired. Uh, he, he's not just tired physically, he's tired spiritually as well. And, and he, he, he's, he, you could say that he's going through the motions. He's doing what he's done for many, many years, but this time is different. This time, according to his words, he has an encounter with God. He's not just going to church. He's not just, uh, 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 just, you know, you know, just doing whatever you do per se. He has an encounter with God. It's not just, I had a good service. It's not just, you know, I read my Bible and the word just jumped out. No, he has an encounter with God. Something supernaturally took place at this time. And this morning, I want to preach a sermon I simply call, Do What You Know To Do. Because listen to me, church, it is so important, more now than ever, that we do what we know to do. Because God wants to move, church. He really wants to do something that will blow our minds. But it really only comes when we do what we know to do. Let's look at the account of a man tonight, this morning, should I say. And uh, something powerful happens when this man did what he knew to do. First Kings uh, 22, let's read from verse 34. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of the battle for I am wounded. The battle increased that day and the king was uh, 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 propped up uh, in his chariot facing the Syrians and died at evening. The blood ran out from the wounds onto the floor of the chariot. Then as the sun was going down, a shout went throughout the army saying, every man to his city and every man to his own country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria and they buried the king in Samaria. Verse 30, uh, uh, 38, then someone washed the chariot at a pool in Samaria and the dogs licked up his blood while the, ch the harlots uh, bathed according to the word of the Lord, which he had uh, spoken. Father, this morning, we are grateful again, uh, Lord, that you would allow us to gather as your people. Uh, I'm asking this morning for help. Uh, I'm asking, Lord, this word, Lord, be an encounter. Let it be a word in due season. Uh, Father, you know the hearts, you know the lives, you know the circumstances of your church, of your people. Uh, God, those who are here, God, those who are listening, uh, I pray the visitation of God. I pray the visitation of heaven. Father, I'm asking right now, God, uh, let our eyes be open. Let the scales of deception let the scales of the flesh, let the scales of the enemy fall off, God, and let us see, Father, with the eyes of God. Father, I'm asking this morning you would save. I'm asking this morning backsliders will come back home. I'm asking, God, you would dismantle and destroy every spirit of religiosity, God. Glorify your name this morning. We did. We give you all the glory, all the praise, in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, amen. And amen. I want to look at this morning a water we don't see. Number one, we want to consider water we don't see. Ahab is the king of Israel. 
That means he sits upon the throne. That means he's ruling a whole nation and he rules the nation uh, sitting on the throne. But also this morning, um, we find a man who's also sitting under the judgment of God. You see, without doubt, Ahab was the most wicked king Israel has ever had. This man is responsible uh, for many, many uh, uh, atrocities that he did. Uh, and you can say this morning, he literally leveled up uh, when he married a woman called Jezebel. And let me pause and say this this morning, church, uh, who you marry can bring the best out of you or the worst out of you. Who you marry, man, has the power, man, to make you a great man or a great woman or a horrible man or a horrible woman. The Bible tells us that Solomon's many wives turned his heart away from God onto idols this morning. And listen to me, church, it's important whether you're male and female, don't get caught up in looks. It is important this morning, amen, that you begin to watch their spiritual life, not their knowledge, amen, about God. Because it's very important this morning to understand that the people who can talk the talk, but the question is, are they walking the walk? They can quote the scripture, but are they doing or are they living the scripture? So here it is this morning. Here is Ahab, amen. He's a wicked man, but he becomes, you can say, even more vile and more wicked due to the woman that he married called Jezebel. Now this morning, his heart had already turned from God, but the Bible tells us that Jezebel introduced Ahab and also all of Israel to Baal worship. The introduction of Baal worship brings the introduction of Elijah, the man of God, and a, a conflict arises between Ahab, Jezebel, and, uh, and Elijah. And there's this back and forth, you can say, between these two. And you can say what the, the straw that broke the camel's back is when Ahab killed a man called Naboth. In the Bible, there's an account of what I call the Naboth saga. And the Bible tells us that Ahab is the king of Israel, and his next door neighbor, per se, is this man called Naboth. One day, Ahab looks outside of his window, and he sees the, 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 the vineyard of Naboth, and he says, you know, that's a nice vineyard. I want that vineyard for myself. So he approaches Naboth and says, listen, I want your, uh, your vineyard. Listen, I'll buy it for you. I'll give you money for it. In fact, if you don't want money, I'll give you a better vineyard than the one you have. Have. Naboth refuses and says, I can't uh, uh, sell my inheritance uh, to you. This belonged to my father and my father's father be uh, before him. This is an inheritance. This is far deeper than money. I can't uh, uh, receive any amount of money for that. No, no, no. I'm rejecting your offer, Ahab. The Bible says Ahab goes home. He falls in his bed. He puts his pillow over his head, literally, and he begins to cry. Jezebel comes in and basically says, what's going on, baby? You okay? And Ahab goes, no, no, no. Naboth refuses to sell. Tell me, vineyard is not there. Literally, that happens. You read it yourself. And the Bible says, Jezebel says, don't worry, I'm going to take care of it. And she conspires this false lies. And basically, she gets a neighbor killed because of Ahab. Now, when Ahab killed Naboth, you can say he literally crossed the borderline. He did something he should not have done. And God is almost saying, listen, I've given you ample time to get it together, but now you've gone and done it, Ahab. He, he crossed a line. Let me pause and say this morning, church, there's a line. We all have a line we should not be crossing this morning. We all have a line, amen, that is there, whether you believe it or not, that you and I dare not cross that line. And this time, amen, Ahab crosses the line and God literally puts a death warrant on Ahab. Now, this is what I want you to do this morning, church. There are things, there are many things that you and I don't see. There are so many things you and I don't see with the naked eye. We can talk about air or oxygen. Air or oxygen is responsible for us being alive. If there's no air or oxygen this morning, we'll be dead, but we can't see it this morning, church. We can talk about this morning, then, about gravity. Gravity, amen, is what uh, brings out something from a high place, uh, amen, and brings it, amen, low. We can talk this morning about the mind, and I'm not talking about the brain. The brain is like the hard way this morning, but I'm talking about the mind. I'm talking about your thoughts. You can't see thoughts. I could talk this morning about smell. You can't see smell. There's so many things that you and I simply cannot see. You know we can't see God? None of us can see in fact, none of us have seen God. I'm going to go out on a limb this morning. Twice in the Bible, maybe three times, maybe three. But twice in the Bible, we see an interaction with God and, 
and heavenly beings. This is interaction with God and heavenly beings in which they are speaking and they are speaking about specific people who are not in their presence. They're speaking about specific people who are not there with them. One of the accounts we see of that is with God and Satan, and they're speaking about Job. And the Bible says that Satan comes into the presence of God, and God says to Satan, where have you been? He goes, well, I've been to and fro the earth, back and forth. And God looks at Satan and basically says, have you seen this morning? Have you considered, have you noticed my servant Job? And that's when you have this account where Satan says to God, well, uh, the only reason he's a good guy, the only reason he's blameless, the only reason you can say all those good things about him is because you protected him, you surrounded him with a hedge, you removed your protection, you removed your blessing, and he will curse you to his face, your face. Uh, and here's God says, I've done it, only don't kill him. And we find out, amen, in a man, Job, that Job was bigger on the inside than he was on the outside. That it was not about the stuff that he had, amen, but it was about what was going on in his heart regarding his relationship with God. The second time we see is earlier in our scripture in chapter 22. In chapter 22, amen, of 1 Kings, the Bible tells us the prophet Micaiah has a vision of heaven. And in heaven this morning, they're having a discussion how they're going to kill Ahab. God help you this morning if God decides that's it for you. Again, in your time, read it yourself, chapter 22. They're having a discussion. God says, who, who's going to kill Ahab? Can you imagine in, in heaven having a discussion about that regarding you and me? Who's going to kill Abdul? That's what's happening. You can read it yourself. Who's going to kill Ahab? And Ahab, this morning, he knows that God is out to get him. And the reason he knows, because the prophet Makai tells him this is what's going on. And the Bible says this man tries to do something that I know none of us has ever done before this morning. He tries to trick God. He tries to outwit God. He has a friend, another king. His name is Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah. And the Bible says you have Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. You have Ahab, the king of Israel. They're sitting down there fellowshiping and having a good time. Then Ahab speaks about a king who is kind of uh, 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 the Syria, the king of Syria, who has uh, assaulted him, who is, uh, who is who's defiled, who is vexed him per se. And he says, listen, I'm going to go to war with this guy. Jehoshaphat, would you go to war with me? And Jehoshaphat says, listen, me and you are bros. Me and you are kings. Me and you are we're family. Listen, what, my people are your people. My army is your army. And, and Ahab says, fantastic. That's great. I'll tell you what. What I'm going to do is I want you to wear my armor. I want you to dress up like me. I want you to just, just, just wear my armor, and it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be good, and I'm going to dress up as a common soldier. I'm going to dress up as a common um, everyday soldier. So you'd wear up my armor, and I'm going, to, I'm going to go as a common soldier, and we're going to go to battle. And Jehoshaphat, like a fool, says, that's a fantastic idea. So they go into battle. And if you know anything about the old days when they fight, when you go into the battle, number one, a king always goes to battles with his, with his army. But number two this morning, amen, in that battle, because the opposing army know the king is there, guess who they go after? Guess who they want to kill? Guess who is public num enemy number one? It's the king. Because if you kill the king, everyone is demoralized, everyone is discouraged, and the war is lost or won, depending on which king you kill. So they go into battle, and all of a sudden, all the armies begin, the army of Syria begins to focus on Jehoshaphat, uh, thinking that he's Ahab. So they begin to attack him, they begin to come against him, they begin to try to kill him, and long story short, Jehoshaphat uh, comes out and says, listen, it's not me, I'm not Ahab, and they realize it's not him, and they, 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 they begin to uh, just continue to fight. And the Bible tells us in our text that an archer, an archer fires an arrow. He's not aiming at Ahab. In fact, the Bible say, uses the word at random. This is one of my son's favorite words, just random, just random that, right? He, he, he fires his arrow at random. He's not even aiming. You know, you, just, you see those old things, just, you know, when they, they, they you, 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 you see it. No, no, they didn't do this. You know, and he just fires, just, uh, uh, they aim up and it comes down. The Bible says he fires his arrow at random and he hits Ahab. Who remembers that song? Bad boys, bad boys. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Who remembers that song? Bad boys, bad boys. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when God comes for you? He fires his arrow at random. And the Bible says he, it goes between the joints of the armor. I mean, you, you can't plan this. 
I mean, it's such a thin gap. It's such a small gap. You see, I'm, it's, it's it usually they're, they're completely covered up, you know. And this, the, the most, the most slightest uh, opening, this arrow is able to penetrate and kill Ahab. Let me help somebody this morning. You can run, but you can't hide. Because when God decides he's going to get you, he's going to get you. And if you don't believe me, ask Jonah, who tried to run, but he couldn't hide. Because when God decided, Jonah, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, get you, get you. One way or another. I'm, going, I'm, I'm losing track this morning. So here's this archer. I want you to think about this. He fires this arrow. Boom. Now think with me, church. This archer didn't plan this. He just simply did what he always did. But this time, God puts his hand on it. This man would have fired hundreds of arrows. This man maybe would have fired thousands of arrows. But this shot, this one shot he made, changed everything. He has no idea that in heaven, God is about to move through him and is literally going to change everything anything church when god wants to move he looks for the faithful therefore he has called your night to be faithful over and over again because we have no idea when god is going to do something this morning church so this morning church there's places that god expects us to be and there are things he expects us to be doing we are told um, in Luke 16, verse 10, by the Lord Jesus, uh, he who is faithful in what is least uh, is faithful also in much. Uh, and he who is unjust in what is least uh, is unjust in what is much. Uh, and what Jesus Christ is saying this morning is you cannot do big things if you're disobedient in the little things this morning. See, what we don't see is that God promotes the little decisions in life. That is not about the platform this morning. It's about the private that when you understand that God is your audience, it will change your approach to how you see him and approach the small and the minuscule and the tiny and the so-called insignificant moments in life. We must understand this morning that destiny and a move of God is not about the big things this morning, but it's about the little things that make or create the big things. Church, it is not about preaching the altar call. It's about us in the altar call. It is not about, amen, how much money you're going to give when you finally make it big. It's about, amen, what are you doing with the little you have now? It's not about, amen, the fact that I don't want pastor to know. Amen, so I'm going to pretend. I'm going to hide because I can see pastor. No, 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 no. It's about the God who sees and God who knows, and you cannot see God this morning. Here is a man. He draws his arrow. And this morning, church, he does something he's always done. He would have missed some shots, uh, and he would have made some shots, uh, but this is not like any other time he's done it before, because this time God is aiming the arrow. So consider being at my place. Because church, there are many things that we have stopped doing that God never intended for us to stop. Somebody needs to hear that again. There are many things that we have stopped doing, that you have stopped doing, that I have stopped doing, that God has never intended for us to stop. On Wednesdays, I'm doing a series called Back to Basics. And this series is all about the basics of Christianity. It's about things that we never outgrow. It's about things, church, that we are never meant to stop. These are things that are, you can say they are routine. They are things that are to be done over and over and over and over again. You see, I learned early in my salvation. I learned this lesson. I remember very clearly when it happened. I had probably been saved for just over a year. I remember being at a fellowship. And it was an evening, and I came out of the I came out of the fellowship. People were sitting in the house talking, bossing, joke, playing games, etc. I came out of the house, and I went into my friend's car, and I sat down. And the older brother in the church came, and he saw, he, he looked to me, and he found me, and he sat in the car, and we were talking, and he realized there was something happening. I began to share with him, and basically, I was going through my first trial. I've never been through a trial before. You know, I'm 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 still very much a new Christian, and you know, you're on this spiritual high, and everything is new, and everything is great, everything's wonderful. But I'm going through a difficult time right now, and 
I feel like packing it in. I want to throw in the towel. I want to go back to the world because you always go back to what you know. You always go back to what you spend a lot of time in doing. And I want to go back and he begins to encourage me. He begins to speak into my life and he begins to challenge me. And he's the one that taught me this very simple uh, principle this morning, church. Uh, that listen, when times are cloudy, when your walk with God may seem stale, when you are confused, I can throw in some more things. He simply taught me this, and he told me this, Abdul, do what you know to do. What do I know to do? I know to pray. I know to come to church. I know to keep on giving. I know to be a witness, amen, to honor God, with a, amen, with my, 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 my testimony. Listen, I know, amen, to read my Bible and spend time, amen, with the word of God. And these are routine things. These are things this morning that every Christian man or woman, I don't care whether you've been saved one year or saved, amen, 200 years this morning, amen, this is something, amen, that should never stop. This is something that should always be part of your life. This is something that always should be flowing, amen, through your spiritual veins this morning. Amen, the routine, everyday thing things, amen, the routine, amen, uh, basics of Christianity. Listen, I thank God this morning for the routine checks done on a plane before the plane takes off. You don't see it, but they do it. And it is vital these checks are done because if these checks are done, it is one of the reasons that a great plane that is able to divide, gra that divide gravity this morning can come, come crashing down because a check, a simple routine check was not done. See, the little things you don't think that matter could matter much more than you can imagine. So you need to understand that God meets with his people in the place of faithfulness. Here is Zacharias. Zacharias is married to a woman called Elizabeth. Elizabeth is a cousin of Mary. And they are all the couple. And the Bible tells us this woman has been barren. She's not been able to have a child. And here is this old man. Here is this old woman. And, and Zacharias is a priest. And think about it. For years, amen, he's been a priest. And for years, he's been offering incense at the temple and just simply coming and offering incense in the temple and simply coming and offering incense at the temple. But one day, we are told that an angel shows up. And not just any angel, Gabriel. Listen to me. I would like to see an angel. I don't care. Amen. Give me a small angel. Give me the most tiniest, my new skinny market angel. No, 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 no. Gabriel shows up. Amen. This is one of the big boys of heaven. He shows up and he begins to speak to Zachariah. Begins to tell him, listen, your wife is going to have a son. And this son is going to have the spirit of Elijah. And this boy is going to be mighty in Israel. And he begins to speak, amen. And everything begins to change. Because a man this morning, amen, was just simply faithful, amen. And just simply doing what he's always been doing. You know what? The will of God has a location. It's not mysterious. It's not hidden. It's not spooky this morning. It is simply being faithful at the place, your place, doing what you know to do. Being faithful at your place, doing what you know to do. Because we can think at ourselves, you know, what's the point of outreach? What's the point of coming to church? Does it really matter whether I'm here or I'm not here? What difference does it make? What's the point coming to revival? Been to one, been to one more. What's the point of conference? Bah humbug. It's all the same this morning. Church, God meets us when we are faithful. Here's his archer. He's simply this morning, he's faithful doing what he knew to do. I'm an archer. And he fires his bow. Amen. I'm an archer. And he fires his bow. I'm an archer. And he shows up and he fires his bow. It's been said this morning about the will of God that the will of God is certain people doing certain things in certain places at certain times. Years ago, I saw a film. Maybe if you saw it, it's called uh, uh, Saving Private Ryan. So years ago, and it affected me. I never forgot it. And Saving Private Ryan is, is about, it's a World War II film. It's old now. And it, 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 it made a lot of headway when it came out because how graphic it was. And it really gave you the realities of war. 
It gave, really gave you the, the real details of what happens when you go into battle. And, and here it is, uh, uh, what blew my mind, because uh, you know, you, you, would, you would see a soldier and a, a soldier was simply just somebody who, who decided, you know what, I'm going to be a soldier. That was, you can say, uh, uh, their desire in life. They want to be a soldier. Uh, but listen, it blew my mind to know that many so-called soldiers, when they went into the Second World War, some of them were teachers. Some of them were doctors. Some of them were lawyers. Some of them were gardeners. And they, they joined the army and they, they have no clue about combat. They have no clue about all these things. And they go and you can imagine they go and they, they, they see the reality of war. They, they fight and they see their brethren uh, uh, all of a sudden uh, 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 freeze because the bullets are flying. They see, uh, I mean, people, limbs and arms and necks being this, uh, dismembered and blood and guts everywhere. And just uh, that's this way we, I mean, we have the, uh, what's it called, post-dramatic stress disorder, PTSD. Uh, and it begins to come because of all they have been exposed to and the reality of it. And I remember in this film what happened, there is a man, uh, there is a, comp, there's a there's a platoon of uh, uh, soldiers uh, and they all, they've been told, okay, you need to go over here and you need to go to this ridge and you're going to hide this rock, there because the enemy was about to come um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, overrun them. But if they simply did what they were told uh, and they were able to overcome the enemy, okay, you go over here, you stay there. And it was stationed in a specific place and a man was told, all right, make sure you're here because this time we want you to shoot over here and you're able to take care of this. And the man that was put up a specific place he doesn't go to where he's go where he's told to go he decides to go where he wants to go and because of that his comrades are killed because here is a man this morning that did not position himself in his place our archer this morning was at his place he positioned himself there one of the qualities of a skilled man this morning Staying at your place. They said the early combats of Christianity in Africa were prayer warriors. That they loved nothing more than getting a hold of God in prayer. And what they would do, they would go to, into the bush and they would go to separate spots within a bush. And there they would begin to pray and spend time with God. And because of the traffic of them faithfully going to that specific spot, it began to wear out the grass or the bush area where they would go to pray. And the account goes that they began to realize when a brother or a sister began to neglect prayer and become very apparently to everybody. And what happened is this, they came up with a way to begin to remind that brother or that sister about them neglecting their prayer and they'll simply say this, brother, the grass is growing in your patch. Because they haven't been going. Because when they're going, the, the patch is just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just flat, it's just low, there's nothing there because of the traffic and the time. Amen, of them just spending with God. But because they haven't gone, all of a sudden the grass begins to grow again. They say, brother, the grass is growing in your patch. Can I ask a question this morning? Is the grass growing in your patch, brother? Is the grass growing in your patch, sister? How many people here, you've played rounders before? Lift your hand up. In this church, you should have played rounders. Idris is the king of rounders. Come on. You've played rounders before. How many people? All right. All right. Some of it. What about cricket? Who's played cricket before? All right. Good. Now, if you know anything about rounders or anything about uh, 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 cricket this morning, you will know this morning that what happens when the captain, usually the captain, or sometimes people in the team because they're so excited, use the captain, they will position you for specific places. In cricket, it could be behind the wicket. You know, so, you know, so they say, so, okay, go over there. No, 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 over there. Go over there. Go, no, no, go over Okay, stand there. Okay, you know, go a bit more to the right. Okay, stand, stay there. And they begin to position you in specific places. And the reason they position you in specific places, but listen to me, if you stay there, Sooner or later, the ball is going to come your way. That if you simply stay at that place, don't watch that. Sooner or later, the ball will appear. And you have the opportunity to catch that ball and remove the team or the opposing team from winning the game. 
The Bible tells us here is John the Baptist. He's a forerunner of Messiah. He's the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And he is, he positioned himself by the Jordan River so much so. The Bible says all of Jordan and Judea would come down to be baptized by John. And I thought about this. John would have baptized so many people. John would have, man, would have laid them down and brought them back up. But one day, Messiah showed up. One day. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world showed up. And if you read the scriptures, you check it yourself. When God uh, spoke from heaven and affirmed Jesus Christ, and this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, the Bible says John heard it. Because he was positioned. Listen, I don't know what your ball is this morning. But I do know if you stay in your place. I don't know if you carry on doing this morning what you know to do. One day, the ball's going to come your way. One day, man, God's going to do what he said he can do this morning. See, like our text, we're at war. And it is important this morning that you and I are our place. Because God is looking for the faithful to move in a miraculous way. There's a great account in Luke chapter 5 and in verse 17. And one of those ones is always, when I tomorrow read it, it catches me. The Bible says, now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching, this is Jesus teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. I have read that so many times. And it still blows my mind. The Bible doesn't put things in the Bible just for Bibles, just for information's sake. Because the Bible tells us, and I don't see this anywhere else. The Bible tells us the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Are you saying that it wasn't present in other places? I read stuff and I think, what's going on here? Why is it saying that? Are you saying it was present here, but it wasn't present over there? Are you saying it's only present here, but it's not present over there? Now, I'm not going to claim this morning that I know everything, and I don't this morning. There's so many things I'm still trying to understand myself. But what I do know, church, on this day, the Bible says the Lord's power was present. It wasn't every day that Jesus Christ was healing people this morning and doing miracles, but on this day he was. On this day, something powerful was going to happen. And the Bible tells us on this day, he's in his house. I mean, there are people, amen, are surrounding him because they want a miracle. They're surrounding him because they've been touched by the word of God. And the Bible says there are four men who come and they bring their friend. He's on a bed. He's lame, amen. He can't function at all. They bring their friend and their friend is miraculously healed by God. You know the account. I mean, they climb up on the roof of the house. They remove the roof tiles and they load this man down and he's healed, amen, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice at this great miracles but think about this church what have decided not to, for them what if they decided i'm not taking this man to jesus on this day what if they decided you know what i'll just stay at home just my, my. We've, we've taken them everywhere before and they've kind of let us down yes we hear about this guy called jesus blah 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 jesus uh, j-e-s-u-s blah 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 forget him uh, we're just gonna stay at home today could you imagine if they did that could you imagine why well, i can't just be bothered today i'm just gonna stay at home and i'm just gonna watch these this no they took this man, they gathered this man, they went through all the issues and all the struggles and put them together and they brought him amen, to where the Lord Jesus Christ was. And even when they got there, there were obstacles because the house was filled in the house, but also going into the house. I mean, there was an obstacle of the house itself. But the Bible tells us this man broke through the obstacles. They pushed through him and then pick up the mind they used. Let's get him on the roof. Let's remove him in the roof tiles or the roof straws, where it is, and let's lower him down to where Jesus at and regardless of the obstacles that we was facing this morning they pushed through there's so many things amen that are against us meeting with God these days there's so many things we can talk about the weather we can talk about just being tired from work we can talk about amen, maybe the issues at home we could go on and on and on this morning there's so many things against us meeting with God but listen if we just push through if we don't allow those things to become an excuse, if we don't allow those things to become a hindrance this morning, let me tell you something. If we just push through just like that man, that day could be your day. 
You know what I've come to realize? Is we disregard the importance of placement. I don't have to pray. I don't have to give. I don't have to be here. I mean, is it really going to matter if I'm here or not? It did for this guy. It did for our text. You know, people say, you know, the people who aren't Christians and some who say they are, well, I don't have to come to church to be a Christian. Who's heard that before? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to come to church to be a Christian. Well, you don't have to go home to be married either. But in both cases, if you don't go home, you're going to have a horrible relationship. It mattered in our text. See, let me say this. Not every service, have you realized, not every service is the same. Some services, you're going to come sometimes, it's going to be like, okay. All right. Hi, you all right? Okay. And you kind of go home and that's it. But you know what's important? You were there. You were at your place. Not every outreach is the same. Sometimes you're going to go to like, Sometimes you talk to your friend. And you may see one person. Sometimes it is what it is. But sometimes, other times, those of you who were here, uh, when you were, those of you who went to Japan, you know what I'm talking about. Now, I think we outreached maybe three times, possibly four. Who remembers the last day? That last outreach. If you were there, you knew God came down that last outreach. You know that we were here, we are, we're trying to get going that final day, and the police kind of shoot us off from that area. But that was the best thing they could have done for us. Because we go to some other random area, we go to some random area, and we just began to minister. All of a sudden, God came down. I still have goose pimples thinking about it. All of a sudden, the crowd begins to gather. We begin to minister and sing. And people are witnessing. People are taking details. And, uh, you know, this guy begins to manifest. It all began to happen. And listen, we all left there buzzing. So much so, if you listen, if you remember the account of Pastor Alonzo, he had only been there for about five, six months when we came to that church. He only been there for about five or six months. And when he gave his report, he said, Sir, that one time, that one team, that one outreach, amen, has done more that he did and his wife did and the church did in that six months. That that one outreach, they received a, a, a whole bunch of visitors the next day, I mean, because we had to fly out up, I mean, they received a whole bunch of visitors the next day and listen to me, they're still in church today. You know, some of you men, you like football. You love your football. And maybe you didn't catch a game on your pad your phone but you can always see the highlights who knows what highlights are highlights are the exciting part of something a lie that's what they're, 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 just, they're just the exciting parts they're the part that matters you can say right a lot of what we do for god is not going to be highlights what's again 90 minutes and within that 90 minutes maybe about 10 is highlights but the rest is just. That's it. And everyone goes home. But in that 10 minutes, like you watch and you think the whole game was like that. Listen, the whole of Christianity is a woo, ha, ha, he, ha, he, hoo, hoo, hoo. No. It's not going to be that way. It never is. Listen to what Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 8. He says, like a bird that wanders from its nest is a man who wanders from his place. Do you know you have a place? Every single person here, you have a place. I'm going to reveal something to you that my wife knows very well. I am easily, easily distracted doesn't take much to distract me. 
I'm, I'm easily, I could be doing something all of a sudden, ooh, what's that? I'm just distracted. I'm just very just easily. And before you know it, it's like time has passed and I've just been distracted. I'm easily distracted. Now, later, I'm aware of it. And because I'm aware of it, I've taken precautions regarding it. There are things this morning that we, 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 we need to be aware of about ourselves. And we need to take precautions to address it this morning. Because the Bible tells us that it, it like a bird that wanders from its nest is a man who wanders from his place. The best place for a bird is his nest. It's safe there. It's protected there. It's provided uh, for there. But the problem is the bird can be led away. It can be distracted from the place that is best for it. Uh, and it ends up being ensnared. And here is Solomon, the wisest man in the world this morning. He says, people are like birds this morning. We can be distracted and lose sight of the importance of the best place for us. We can lose sight, amen, of the importance of our place. And we can begin to wander. And church, when we wander like the bird, we can become ensnared. We can become trapped. I think about the early days of many churches. Even some of you who were here in the real early days, you remember in the early days, you will meet uh, uh, in a, maybe in a community hall somewhere, and here it is. Uh, uh, you have to set ready. You have to set and prepare for church, and maybe you get a little carpet. You lay at the front. Uh, that would be the altar area, and people have to come and put the chairs up, and you set up the equipment, and whatever you got there, and uh, put the wires in place, and maybe you have to sweep up the place and because of the people who were there the night before, and everything is kind of setting up, and people are coming to the church as the church begins to grow, and everyone's kind of playing, doing their own bit, and some people help out the chairs, and some people help out to put up the, uh, the, the, the equipment in the place and some people amen roll out the carpet uh, and then someone i remember we used to build the stage we had to we had about four boxes we would put together that'll make the stage the pastor would stand before and preach uh, and we'd be able to carry and put it away uh, and everyone's kind of doing everyone's do something but when the church begins to progress and get their own building and maybe a pandemic hits but even before the pandemic but even more when the pandemic hits we just kind of I don't know what to do. You know what you can do? You can come here early and still pray. You can still come and cover this place with prayer. You pray for the service, you pray for yourself, God, I need to hear from you. You pray for your brother, your sister that you know is coming or you know that's going through some stuff. You pray for Tottenham. That even though we may not be able to do certain things, church, we can still pray before service. That's something we can all do. We can all lay a hold of God because it makes such a big difference in a service. Again, when we understand that God is our audience this morning, it makes such a big difference in what we do and how we do it. I want to close this morning and just look at God is going to move. I will make a statement this morning. There is nothing, listen to me, church. There is nothing random about God. Because in verse 34, the Bible says about our man, this, this, this archer, he draws a bow at random. In this archer's mind, I'm simply in another war. In this archer's mind, it's simply, or wherever, another arrow. In this archer's mind, okay, they've told me to go and position myself to the east or position myself to the west or position myself with battalion, uh, 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 battalion Syria over there, like they always do. That's all that's going on in this archer's mind. And he has no clue that in heaven, God is about to change the world. That God has, he has no clue that God has put a hit on, pardon the pun. He's put a hit on Ahab. And God is about to do what God is going to do. And God did it with a man who was at his place. He was just there. Here is Peter. Peter catches a, 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 a catch of a lifetime. So much so, the boat that he's in begins to sink. He, 
calls upon his partners were on the other smaller boats, they get more fish and their boats are about to sink. I mean, this is a catch of a lifetime. This is where you begin to tell all your friends, begin to boast, and they don't believe you, but it's true. You're not exaggerating. I was this big, and it's true. He gets a catch of a lifetime. He becomes a disciple that changes the world because he was at his place. Here's Mary. Mary is the chosen vessel that the Lord Jesus was going to use to come into the world because this morning she valued the place of her virginity. Are you trying to say that Mary was the only virgin at that time? Of course she wasn't. Then why did God choose Mary and not all the other girls? Because as the Bible says, Mary found favor. It's simply the grace of God. I choose you. End of story. Why did Michelle say yes to Abdul? Because she chose me. She could have chosen anybody. It's the grace of God. And this morning, God has chosen us, folks. But me, the grace of God. Because she valued her place. And I'm going to value this thing. And this morning, church, we have no idea when or how God is going to move. But make no mistake, he's going to move. And it's not going to be random this morning. It's not going to be, oh, we don't know what happened here. How did this take place? None at all. Jewish legend believes that this archer just fired his bow at random. Jewish legend believed that this man was none other than, if you read your Bible, once I say his name, you know what I'm talking about. None other than Naaman. Who knows who Naaman is? Naaman the Syrian. Some of you are looking at me like, oh no, 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 no. Naaman is the guy who had leprosy that was healed. Duncan, go in the river Jordan seven times, come out and you should be, who knows who Naaman is now, right? That's who Naaman, Jewish legend believed this guy that fired the arrow was Naaman. Now we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We have no idea. But let's suppose it was. Let's, 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 let's work with that. I say maybe this man was Naaman. If this is true, years later, he has another encounter with God. I have no, idea, I have no, no doubt in my mind when he fired that arrow that day, there was a need in his life. And he fires that arrow. He kills Ahab. He becomes a hero. He begins to excel through the, the army. Maybe he's just a regular, he's just a regular, one of the most lowest of people in the army at that time was the archer. I mean, this is nobody. This is, this is, not, this is not a general. This is not a, 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 you know, this is just an archer. And he fight, the moment he fight and he killed the king, he becomes a man. He is a zero that becomes a hero. He has nothing. Now he literally has the world at his feet because of God. And years down the road, he has a need again. It's a need, amen, of, of healing. And he has an encounter with God. And he's healed by God. Because, listen, church, he's still faithful. He's still being a faithful soldier. He said, well, I retired from the army. I'm going to leave for you, young bucks. And, you know, I've done my bit for society. And, you know, you guys can do it. I've done my bit. Uh, and yeah, I'm just going to take the... No, 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 no. He's still, I'm, I'm still going to be a soldier for God. And God met with him. You see, church, when we avail ourselves... We have no idea which outreach. We have no idea which service. We have no idea which prayer meeting. We have no idea which offering. Listen to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse, six, verse 13 to 16. Verse says, and Elijah, who was dealing with Ahab at that time, Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake first and bring it to me. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, 
nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. It's a famine, folks. People don't have nothing. And God sends Elijah to a widow. She's known as the widow of Zarephath. Talk about poor. Talk about Brock. Go to her. Because listen to this. I've commanded her to look after you. He gets there. And it's just as God says. His widow's there. And we don't hear, we don't see the account where God speaks to her. We don't need to. Elijah simply tells her, listen, go get me something. I'm going to eat. Because listen, I'm about to die. Just me and my son. What are you talking about? Hey, listen, if I do this for you, we're going to have enough for ourselves. And he goes, go, I hear what you're saying, but make me a small cake first. Then you'll be okay. When you see that first this morning, amen, it's what the tithe is. The tithe is not just a tenth. It's given to God first. It's honoring God first. He's saying, God, I put you first. And the Bible says, as she obeys this morning, we read in our text, the Bible says that her and her household ate for many days. Here is this nameless widow who I'm sure that many times this morning, amen, before she's commanded by God, amen, to give and to honor God, amen. But here is a time of a famine, and this time is completely different because the blessing doesn't stop. In fact, it goes on for many days, we're told, which simply means in Bible terminology for a long time. That for a long time, she's getting seriously, severely, amen, ridiculously hooked up by God. Because she put God first. There are things that we have stopped doing that God never intended for us to stop. Holy Spirit, speak to your church right now. There are things that you stopped doing that God never intended for you. God never told you to stop. And this morning, I believe these are things you don't outgrow. These are things that we see as minor, as insignificant, and little, but it is little things that end up making the big thing. And I believe this morning, this is what Paul meant as I close in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall. Not may, not could, not there's a possibility. You shall reap if you don't lose heart. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Amen.